Hi, everybody. Welcome to Holly Randall Unfiltered. Today, I have Justine Eng Fonte on. She is an intersectional sex educator. She actually teaches porn literacy to adolescents, which I think is an incredibly important um, subject to be tackling these days. We cannot deny that the world has changed. And so I'm so happy to have Justine here today. So Justine, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, Holly. I'm really honored to be here. So what made you decide to get into this, um, line of work? It's pretty specific actually. And I have to say you're, I've, I've interviewed a lot of sex educators on my show, but I've never interviewed anybody who specifically focuses on teaching porn literacy to adolescents. Um, that's a pretty controversial, but in my opinion, necessary role. So tell us a little bit about how you got into it and what made you see the need for that role to be fulfilled. Yeah, thanks for that question. I got into the world of sex education initially as an eighth grade math teacher, and it was in Houston, Texas, an abstinence only state. And um, 12 years ago, when I was teaching this classroom of 24 students, two of them were already parents and two of them were currently pregnant. And so for me, it was a very clear connection to school and health. And I wanted to do work around health education and specifically sex ed after having those two years of teaching experience um, under my belt. And so after um, I finished up that contract, I moved to New York where I got a master's in public health to pair with a master's in education and really specialized in sexuality. Um, and so a school really trusted me with building their health and wellness program. And I was partial to the sexuality program, of course, given my background. And it, I knew that I had to have content around pornography because it was honestly competing with me as who would be the sex educator for the students that I was working with. And it was really important that they recognize that understanding pornography is not something that can be done well if sex education isn't good. And so I wanted to be able to liberate our children with understanding about how their body works and all of its wonders by knowing how to even do that first in an educative space so that when they are exposed to pornography, they're seeing it as the fantastical sex positive source that it can be as opposed to something that is supposed to make them feel bad about their body. But it's not being paired with that, with sex ed not being prioritized, not being included, being very fear-based. Um, and so I wanted the students to get media literacy lessons like they were about commercials and advertisements in the same way that they would be um, around pornography. Yeah. Wow. That's, um, God, we've talked about that so many times on the show about how the lack of sex education in this country specifically is is really quite terrifying. And now you know, with the internet and, you know, children's ability to access pretty much anything, no matter what the parents think they're doing, um, that porn has become the sex education teacher, you know, in lieu of actually having like a structured sex education class in school. And, you know, I know that this is a touchy subject and there's a lot of parents who don't like the idea about, you know, porn and adolescence being like even in the same sentence, right? But it's like we can't deny the fact that it's out there. Uh, kids are accessing it um, with no background whatsoever in sex education, no understanding of what they're seeing. And um, it's it's a topic that I think we cannot continue to sweep under the rug. It's something that needs to be addressed. So how, like, what was the first, when you first started developing this this plan, like, how did you go about it? Did you, like, do you show them content? Like, what do you show them? Like, how do you approach this? Because this is a tricky subject. Yeah, I think that a lot of people think it's tricky and that it's, um, you know, not something that lives in a classroom setting, but I have a skill set, I believe that I've established to really make content accessible and still safe while they're learning. And, you know, I just started with really thinking about what are what are forms of media that our young people are exposed to that in turn become education for them around a topic? And one of my favorite quotes is from a dear friend of mine who's a clinical psychologist who says that learning um, about physics by watching the Transformers is not something we would do. So why would we learn about sex by watching porn? 
And we have this immediate literacy in Hollywood films. We're not going to learn how to drive a car by watching Fast and the Furious, but we can be entertained by that. So even just simple language on these are porn performers. They are actors. They have training. They have a glam squad. You know, in all of those types of things are things we forget when we're looking at the after picture from, you know, a, a basic photo. And so, you know, just giving them that language that they're already used to hearing on media literacy is where the starting point is for that. And then the second layer, when I'm speaking to either parents um, who are concerned about their kids, you know, porn exposure or the kids themselves, is to really center their viewing on safety, fulfillment and pleasure. And if these three things are things they can center their, um, you know, um, uh, exposure on, it gives them an ability to exercise bodily autonomy. Is what I'm looking at in service of my safety? Is it in service of pleasure? And is it making me feel fulfilled in my identities? And there are so many ways that that is a yes in pornography. But there are many more ways with mainstream pornography that is most accessible to young people that it's not. And making that distinction is what I help them go through. We're watching videos from my favorite sex ed resource called Amaze, and they have cartoon, um, you know, PSAs, if you will, um, where we unpack the different types of messages from mainstream porn um, and where they can be getting information about their bodies they're curious about. So I'm never showing them pornography um, in the sense that adults might, because I don't want to lose my job. And it is federally <laughs> illegal to show anyone under 18 pornography, despite my knowledge of middle schoolers watching pornography and clicking that right. they are 18. So the ways I go about it in a school setting is through a cartoon, you know, video clip, like from amaze.org. We're looking at documentary clips um, around, you know, different porn performers and their experiences behind the scenes, how their lives are very different off screen. So we're, I'm giving them information um, around this, this work and politicizing it so that we can be talking about the industry the ethics, the feminism around it, um, the sexual liberation behind it that is separate from their own personal experience because they're usually not willing to talk to another adult about their own pornographic usage. Right. And the topic of, of porn is is still, you know, such a taboo one. I mean, I know plenty of adults who really need sexual literacy courses <laughs> because, yeah. you know, people have a very skewed idea of what the adult industry about is about. And that's, you know, what I've been trying to do with this podcast is kind of show people another side to it. But I mean, I think just in general, the public is so, um, misled about the industry. So of course, you know, kids would have, would also be incredibly misled. You know, people have this idea of all porn is the same. And, and one mm -hmm. of the things that I'm always trying to tell people is like, Porn is so different. It's like, it's like if you watch a movie and you're like, all movies are the same. They're, they're not all right. the same. There's comedies right. and there's horror movies and there's action. And, and it's the same with porn. There's really hardcore, intense gonzo stuff out there, which, you know, is not for the faint of heart. It's done between consenting adults. So there's nothing wrong with it per se, but you know, not everybody is a fan of, um, gaping assholes, shall we say. Um, and then there's right. other really beautifully made, um, you know, queer positive movies. Um, like Erica Lust has created a lot of these kinds of movies, um, pink label TV and, you know, which is very much about like real human connections and, and the sex is, is wrapped up in like a real story driven, um, character, um, you know, very insightful character, uh, storylines. And so, uh, there's, and the thing is, is that there's just like, but so many people don't know where to go to find those kinds of porn because we don't talk about it ever. You know, they just go on, you know, whatever tube sites out there and they just look at whatever first flashes up on the screen. And usually that's, that's not necessarily like the most tasteful content. It depends on where you go. Um, so I just think the world in general needs porn literacy, but especially adolescents. Um, what have you, what has been your feedback from some of your students or parents, should I say? Um, I think parents usually come to any of my trainings or workshops because they are coming in with a sense of anxiety that 
Um, their kids shouldn't be watching it whatsoever. And what do I do if it's already happened or how do I prevent them from watching more or seeing it? Um, but they're usually coming in with a fairly open mind and um, already subscribing to the fact that I am a sex positive educator, um, but then scared that I'm not just telling them, you know, you know, dislodge your router so that your kid doesn't have access to this stuff. And that's not ever, you know, um, my, my messaging, but they kind of want me to just censor it altogether. And I tell them, well, you know, have you had any discussions about sexuality first? And they said, well, not really. I think they're still a little too young for it. And I said, well, already you're making this harder by waiting until this conversation to be the first time you talk about it. This needs to be an ongoing conversation. If we're giving, you know, sex positive, comprehen comprehensive information to young people, as young as they are verbal, they can be exposed to porn either accidentally or on purpose and be able to already distinguish the difference between what bodies can look like, normalization of using these terms, vulva and penis, knowing how to protect themselves, whether it be from infection or from pregnancy, um, you know, understanding that body hair is normal so that when they see this, they know, oh, this is an entertainment industry or not everyone is like that, or I've seen other bodies and these are just the ones that auditioned for this film, right? We know when we're watching Hollywood films, the number of filters that have come through in order for that to now be the final product. But when we're in a sexually repressed world and kids are Googling, how do I kiss someone? And they're seeing something easily accessible to them and you know, usually free, they're thinking, oh, that's where I'm supposed to kiss someone and how I'm supposed to kiss someone. And my body needs to look like that. And I'm supposed to do that with somebody else's body and be attracted to those types of bodies. And it's sending all these messages because we're not equipping them in you know, our home and in our classroom in ways that make them feel good about themselves and their own identities. So with parents, they're expecting to come in with a, I'm going to get a lesson on censorship. And that's far from what I give them. I say, you want to message your parenting around safety, fulfillment, and pleasure, um, and not like, don't do this, only bad things happen from it. And then with the young people, um, I talk a lot about statistics, because I think they're so scared about how their body is different than what they see on screen. So therefore, they think they're, they're abnormal. And so we talk about, you know, what percentage of people actually keep their body hair around, you know, in their genitals? What percentage of people um, actually squirt? What percentage of people actually swallow cum? You know, whatever it is, because they're thinking, I'm supposed to do these things in order to have the social capital in my friend group or in this relationship. And I want to just demystify that first by saying, here's what is actually common. That might be a lot lower than you think. Because it scares me when a fifth grader asks me and has asked me, when are we supposed to start waxing down there? And I'm recalling their age being 11 years old. And how do they even know that somebody waxes pubic hair? Um, and they're thinking, well, I saw it on a magazine once. So it doesn't even need to be porn at that point, but they have these expectations of what their body is supposed to look like. And this fifth grader is just starting puberty and is already feeling insecure about the de their development. So if we are waiting until, you know, a porn scene they might see in eighth grade and then the parents coming in talking to them about it, you're already having to do three years of unlearning before they can actually start to receive this information in an affirming and literate, you know, uh, literate way. I really love that you use that word unlearning because that's so true. I mean, society does send all of these, these messages, you know, to to kids and to all of us really. And, um, to, to look at porn and think that, you know, it represents what most people's sex lives are like, what most people's bodies look like is, is just, you know, not the case. So you talked about how sex education has to be an ongoing conversation for parents out there who might be concerned about like, how do I have this conversation with my child? At what age should I start? At what stages in their life do I bring up certain topics? Do you have a guideline for parents to follow? I tell parents all the time from the womb to the tomb, we want to talk about consents and body agency as early as we can, because that is the building blocks for understanding your own sexual agency 
when the stakes are a lot higher. But if we start talking about, you know, having the sex talk after they've seen porn, there's too much to still unpack and unlearn. So instead, we want to build a foundation of that bodily autonomy and those messages around what a healthy relationship looks like, what pleasure means, um, you know, what all of those things can do in service of our safety, fulfillment and pleasure so that when they are exposed to a relationship, a friendship, porn, an intimate, you know, behavior, they're, they have those building blocks on, wait, is this safe? Is this making me feel good? And do I feel good about my identities and who I am by engaging in this? But if we just teach that one time in one talk, it's going to be very hard for them to understand because then they're doing it only in the context of I got in trouble for seeing porn or now we're talking about this stuff because of another Me Too story that came out. And we shouldn't be talking about sexuality in the context of violence and tragedy. That is not hot and that is not sex positive. So we wanted them to see what the bar really is of understanding sexuality, which is something that's meant to be beautiful and good for our bodies. Um, and so anything that doesn't serve that is by default non-consensual or is something that we need to, you know, ask advice on or get help on or no longer continue doing or end that relationship about, you know, on. Um, but I think we jump right into only talking about in the in the aftermath of some kind of violence or tragedy. And that already mm. taints what sexuality is meant to be and do for us. So, but could there, I mean, because I, I know, I mean, I'm a parent myself. Um, uh, my daughter isn't even a year yet, so she's clearly not old enough for this conversation because she can't talk. Um, but in my mind, I imagine that, you know, when she gets to the stage that she's talking and she's starting to name her body parts, you know, cause we do nose, eyes, mouth that, you know, we shouldn't leave the, the genitals out because, you know, then you create this idea that this, this idea that like that is something that we don't discuss. And so there's some shame that should be built around that. So, you know, I prepare, I plan to, you know, help her learn the name of her, of her genitals and, and, and all of that. But like, at what point is it, or is it just an organic conversation when you see that, that your child is curious about something or you see that, um, you know, something comes up, not like something traumatic or anything like that, like we discussed, but should parents then just not be afraid to answer these questions as they come up? Or like, is there an age where they should sit down and say, okay, now we're going to talk about the difference between boys and girls. And then like a few years later, now we're going to talk about what love is and kissing. Is there like a structured guideline that parents can follow? Or is it just a kind of fulfilling your child's curiosity in a way that's sex positive and, and not shame-based? I think there's both. I think that there is a curriculum you could follow. There are national sex ed standards from kindergarten to the 12th grade that teachers can be using, but I recommend as a guide for parents to know like, all right, by six years old, what should my kid have already known? By third grade, by sixth grade, by eighth grade, by 12th grade. So that can be a template for the type A parents that are out there. But I do think that instead of age appropriate approaches, we need to do what's relevant. So if your child is asking a question that seems to be younger than what you were expecting them to be ready for, they're already ready for it because they're asking about it. It's already mm -hmm. happening either in their vicinity, in, with their peers on play dates or something they accidentally step, you know, saw and stepped upon, whatever it might be. But um, when the child asks, and if you really don't know the answer, then you just say, you know, I don't really know, but let's find out together. And you can do that. There are plenty of resources out there. But I will say, Holly, like even with your one year old who isn't verbal, there's muscle memory involved with seeing how her bodily autonomy is being respected. So you're not necessarily asking, can I change your diaper? But you're telling her, I'm changing your diaper now. I'm going to uh, dislodge this. I'm going to wipe your vulva here because that's managing expectations. That's helping them to mm -hmm. feel ready for what's about to happen. And when you're going to see a doctor and maybe, you know, her pediatrician and she does become verbal, she's already used to adults in her life that are engaging with her body by telling them first what's going to happen as opposed to just doing it. So if somebody mm -hmm. just comes up and like grabs her, she knows, wait, my, that, that doesn't feel right. 
I'm getting early warning signs in my body that I've been trained to always be told first that something might happen or someone's going to ask me first so that if it just happens, then I know that there's a violation of my body bubble. And that's Mm -hmm. pre-K language right there. Right. And it's like, you know, if there's if she's crying, you know, okay, there's her body is saying that something's not something's threatening her. What is what else is going on as opposed to forcing her to hug, you know, Uncle Charlie every time you see him and she hates doing it. Right. So we're already conditioning young people to do things despite their bodies sending them signals that there's discomfort. So we, this is what I mean by those building blocks early on. So that if there is, you know, a child on the playground that, you know, pulls at her, you know, shorts, and then we say it's probably because they have a crush on her, that this is already where the rape culture comes into play. So there's too much to unlearn when we don't have those building blocks first. And that's what I mean by sex ed is like giving them empowerment over their bodies and letting them know what's happening to it or what might happen to it before it happens. And when they become verbal, giving them an opportunity to say, uh, I'd rather do something else instead. Or, well, that doesn't seem like something I want to do. Can you give me a better explanation as to why the doctor needs to check my genitals right now? But, you know, that's not something we empower young people with. And this is why they become more vulnerable and susceptible to child sexual abuse, because no one's empowering them with that language and that assertion skills earlier on. I really like what you just said about, um, you know, a boy pulling at a girl's shorts and then, you know, you just kind of dismissing it like, oh, he has a crush on you or a boy trying to kiss you and saying, oh, he just has a crush on you. Because you're right, that does kind of send this signal that like, you should be grateful that somebody, you know, has a crush on you, that somebody finds you attractive or that somebody wants to get that close to you or wants to pull at your shorts. But you're right. That's not acceptable. You didn't consent to that. Um, that's an aggressive move without that consent. And, um, it's something that, you know, should be, we should keep an eye on. And that's something that I probably wouldn't have considered, you know? I mean, most of us don't. That's the thing. Boundary setting is not something we were trained to do. And it's so difficult, even as adults, where think about the number of times you've said yes to something you actually didn't want to do and you did it anyway because you felt guilty or you felt you didn't know how or you felt bad or it's just easier to not say anything. Now, imagine the same situation in a sexually intimate setting. And it's why we end up doing things we don't necessarily want to do. So we want to teach them to speak up for themselves. All of us have. I love that. I love that. All right, guys, we're going to take a quick commercial break and we will be right back. Holly Randall Unfiltered is brought to you by Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve is like the biggest online sex toy retail store. And in fact, they don't just offer sex toys. They also have movies. They have lingerie. They basically have anything sexy that you could be looking for. Now they have an incredible offer. Get 50% off of any one item when you go to adamandeve.com. But that's not where it ends. So not only will you get 50% off any one item, they will also load up 10 free gifts for you on top of that. You will get six free movies, a free mystery pack that includes an item for him and a special toy for her and something we know you'll both enjoy, plus free shipping. Now that's a lot of free stuff but you can only get this offer if you go to adamandeve.com and use my code HOLLY. That's adameve.com. Use code HOLLY for 50% off of any one item plus 10 free gifts. All right, everyone, we are back. So I think this term has come up a couple of times since we've been talking, and I know I bring it up quite a bit, in other shows. And I, and I did notice that somebody left in one of my YouTube comments the other day, like, what does mainstream porn mean? And I was like, you know what? We often don't really describe what that means. So Justine, what is your definition of mainstream porn? I think mainstream porn is um, accessible and free porn. Um, I'm thinking of it in those simplified terms because of the fact that I work with young people who um, are legally not able to access Um, porn that they, you know, can pay for to actually support a sex worker's income, 401k health insurance, but they're Googling something quickly and whatever shows up being mainstream because it's easily accessible. Mm -hmm. 
So what would be the difference between say that and like a more carefully curated ethical porn? Um, so when I talk about mainstream porn, which is majority of, you know, the, the context in which we're working in when we're being porn literate, we are talking a lot about sex workers' rights. I think when we don't make the distinction between mainstream porn and ethical porn, we are leaving out the level of marginalization that so many sex workers experience. Because as you mentioned earlier, pornography is so diverse. There are so many different types of, you know, porn that's out there, just like there is different genres of um, Hollywood films you might see. There are not only just different genres within porn, but also the different ways that it's produced. Um, and in some ways it's done ethically in other ways it's um, marginalizing and harming people behind that screen, taking advantage of the people's vulnerabilities behind that screen. And in a way it becomes this, um, you know, critical race theory approach or a history kind of class approach when we're talking about the politics, you know, the, the politics around pornography and that industry. And that's not normally what, you know, they're wanting to jack off to when they are in eighth grade, you know, and talking about, you know, what porn they've seen recently. But that's what I want them to think about, because that's a part of the literacy component that um, amplifies privilege and doesn't regard the oppression that is on the other end of that. They're so used to free music, streaming everything for free. And, you know, I want them to be able to have that same, um, you know, critical thinking skills around something they might have dopamine hits off of from something like pornography, because sex workers are not protected and they're not regarded as, you know, equal citizens. Um, and that is a huge problem when the industry is as prof pro profitable and large as it is. So how is it that we have so many unprotected people that are in this industry, given how um, big of it it actually is? So would you say that like ethical porn then would just be, you know, porn produced by specific studios who kind of make sure that they pay the performers well, that they um, are producing these scenes under safe circumstances where they can set boundaries, where they have autonomy over their body, um, where they maybe have a say in how they're portrayed. I mean, it, it's, it has been changing, but, you know, we, we do see a lot of porn with these kinds of, um, you know, tropes and, um, you know, racial stereotypes, stuff like that. I mean, I, I definitely have talked to performers who have come to set and, you know, read the script, didn't get the script before set, so never had a chance to really vet what they were doing and then read the script and really didn't like the way that it portrayed them and, and walked off. Mm -hmm. I'm glad you bring that up, Holly. I, one of the things that I teach in my classes with my seniors and my juniors um, is, you know, mainstream porn titles and how racialized they are and the implications behind that. Um, you know, our, one of the titles of a, a talk I give is called, Are You a Porn Genre or Are You Privileged? Because white is often not a genre in mainstream porn, but mm -hmm. Japanese is, hentai, Filipino, BBC, Ebony, Indian, Chinese, Korean. Um, and what does that say then? That implies that me and other BIPOC you know, people are a fetish, are exotified, are othered. And we're not the template or standard or status quo of beauty because we aren't a part of white culture. And you know, what are the implications of that? And how might that actually amplify racism when you also have literal dopamine hits that are occurring as you are pleasuring yourself to racialized tropes. And so that's like this whole extra layer that they're often not thinking of. Um, and I want them to, because that's a part of porn literacy. So I think it's important that, you know, we're talking about these porn titles um, and how in a lot of ways, ethical porn takes into account just pleasure, but not needing to lean on racism in order to garner that pleasure in a user. Yeah, it's actually pretty terrifying if you look back at some of the titles of a lot of of these scenes and movies and um it's 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 <laughs> I'm so glad that I never shot for any of those companies that those titles have come out under cuz it's it's truly embarrassing. 
Um, and we, you know, really saw so much conversation. I think such healthy conversation come out around that during the black lives matter protests, you know, and, and so many, um, people of color and the adult industry coming forward and just talking about the way they've been marginalized and the, the stereotypes and the racial tropes, like you spoke about. And I think it really opened so many people's eyes to that. And I've noticed in particular, you know, with brands that I work for, how there's been a real, a real movement towards like diversity in, in scenes. Mm -hmm. And, and I don't think that we were ever really doing racialized tropes for, you know, like Twisties is one of the main companies that I work for. We never were doing that, but they've really made a push for diversity in scenes now. And it's been, it's been really appreciated. And, you know, honestly, like, look, as a, as a privileged white woman, like I, I wasn't really seeing it in the way that like I see it now. And I just feel like it's, I mean, I know there's a long way to go, but I have seen positive changes over the past year. Do you, do you feel the same? Do you think that, that we're moving in the right direction? I think we are. Um, it feels glacial and more glacial than the speed I would like, but I mean, being someone in the sexuality field, of course, I feel like I'm, I'm pushing further than uh, my, what might be realistic. Uh, nonetheless, it, it's comforting to know that when I have these conversations now, they don't seem as much of an introduction to these topics as they once were. People are like, oh yeah, I heard, or I, I listened to a podcast about that, or I read some article about that now. So it's no longer, you know, wow, really? I didn't know this as, as frequently. Um, but even still for some people, when I'm talking to them about my own personal dating life, how, you know, these mainstream porn titles and, you know, implications affect it with people thinking I am subservient and that I am, you know, meant to be dominated and that I am only a fetish because they only date Asian girls, um, you know, and that, you know, whatever, I'll suck my step bro's cock, you know, for math help, you know, things like that. They're just that all of those things are just so dehumanizing and, um, almost like waves my need for consent because I am being hypersexualized by white supremacy. Um, and then, you know, my Asian brothers, both literally and figuratively, are desexualized because of the same racist tropes of being, you know, um, not hot or attractive, small dick, only into IT and, you know, um, doesn't have social skills. And all that, all that is coming from historical images in media, not even porn. But, you know, we aren't we aren't um, allowing for other types of beauty to be present. And if we are, they're playing a stereotypical role in many mainstream porn things. Right. If it's interracial, it's usually a white woman with a black man. Right. And if we're talking about, you know, anal scenes, if it's a white woman that's doing it, it's she's the queen of anal. But if it's a black woman doing it, she's a hip hop whore. If we're talking about black men, it's aggressive. He's an ex-con and he's pounding and being very, you know, um, you know, not present around pain and that that amplifies medical systems and how people don't want to prescribe um, extra care or medicine to black patients because they think that they can tolerate more pain. Like there's just real ramifications to people's health and well-being when we perpetuate these stereotypes. And again, when dopamine is reinforcing those stereotypes, so then it infiltrates people's real life outside of the screen. Right, right. God, that's such a good point. You brought up the stepbrother um, scenario just kind of quickly. I'm interested to know if this whole recent new fetish with, you know, mixed families and the stepbrother, stepmother, stepfather um, genre has how, how adolescents these days are feeling about it. And where do you think that that sudden fascination comes from? Cause it kind of like, for those of us in the adult industry, I, mean, I can tell you what, 10, 10, 15 years ago, like this genre didn't exist. And now all of a sudden I swear to God, it's like all anybody wants you to shoot. Well, I am not a psychologist to be able to answer this well, but I, I believe that something with Freud probably has to do with it. Um, but what I think is true is that mainstream porn has just in general become more and more extreme um, in terms of what types of 
plots or scenes are playing out. Um, and I think that that trend is from a need for people to rely on understanding their sexuality in a way that doesn't involve real relationships as technology has just become more of our everyday um, and smartphones now becoming the norm in terms of a smart device in a household for kids as young as fourth grade, even third grade, having their own phones. Um, there's just more users and there's a dependence that can get, you know, that can come from that um, and therefore a desensitization on things that they're seeing. So then a need for upping the level of whatever you're watching to be more entertaining than what you could easily see from before. And I think that, yes, maybe, you know, incest themes are becoming more prevalent, but I even think too, just like choking someone is becoming a norm, um, not just in porn, but in real life with people thinking that this is what everyone is into because we're seeing so much more of it in porn and mainstream porn. So, I mean, I think just extreme things, rape role play, right? I mean, I got an email the other day from someone who wants to, you know, interview me about anti-Semitic porn and a Nazi scene that's in mainstream porn. And so things are just getting more and more extreme because it's entertaining. It's so different than what we can normally see. And what we're normally seeing has already raised, been so raised because of how much technology has been advanced. How do you talk to kids about the um, recent fluidity in gender roles. I can I guess I shouldn't say recent fluidity because it's not recent that people um feel different about the gender roles that they've been assigned or the sexuality roles that they've been assigned but that we're talking about it more and we're being more accepting about it about non-binary people, trans people and this is being reflected in so much um porn that is being produced now and you see a lot of performers coming out and and talking about um their identities how do you talk to adolescents about that? Because I had, I had a, I have a friend, one of my best friends, she has a daughter who is just turned 14 and she was graduating from middle school, going to high school. And during the commencement ceremony, she goes up to the microphone to like get her commence. I don't know. They don't graduate technically, but whatever it is. And she just announces to the school, like I'm non-binary. And my friend was like, you know, she's holding up her cell phone all excited. And then she's like, wait, what? And she has no problem with her, her daughter be feeling that she's non-binary. She was also in the adult industry at one point, but she's just really hurt that her daughter never talked to her about it and never discussed it with her. And is concerned that her daughter may not even really know what that means. So how are adolescents, um, handling these new topics today and specifically in, in what they see in porn? If you're doing it right, you're talking about gender fluidity as early as you are anatomical parts of, you know, bodies. So from the womb to the tomb, sex ed lives in a two-year-old's room. You're talking to them about these things early, um, but we're already gendering them by assigning them a gender and then saying, okay, so because I see a penis, it means that you have to be a boy and it means you have to wear blue and you have to play football and it means that you have to love girls, right? So we can already talk about gender roles as early as they are identifying as um, a human being because we're already telling them with even just the things that they're playing with that they should be playing with something versus another thing. By already naming them and assigning them, that's when it becomes relevant. Age appropriate, people think like, no, they can't be talking about trans identity until they're much older. Ask any trans person, when did you know? They say, I, I don't even remember when I wasn't. And the studies show that gender identity is realized at ages two to three. And yet we're waiting to talk about it in a gender studies class if you go to college. Right. So, I mean, we need to be talking about this early on. And I do so in my first grade classrooms. I ask students every day at class, tell me what pronoun you would like me to use for you today. Because I know that when I see them next week, it might not be she. It might be they. And it has been. It might be he. It might be anything today, Justine. Call me whatever or call me just by my name. And I, one student said, call me Shorty. I said, great. Right. But we want them to know that they can be who they feel they are, and that I will see them for exactly that identity. And that's something that 
needs to live in classrooms and be gender inclusive so that we can live in a gender full world as opposed to a, a world that we are limited by gender. And there's a huge difference in that. We want them to know they can be their authentic selves and call it what feels right to them. So how does that live in a porn space? I'm glad that there are non-binary porn performers that can now play roles that are non-binary as opposed to what's marketable, because we are still very much in a um, binary you know, world where who do you pass as? Well, you pass and present more female, so you're going to play a woman in this scene as opposed to, but I'm not that. I'm not that. So why can't I play a non-binary character? And we are seeing that even in Hollywood films and in like, you know, TV shows where a non-binary actor is playing a non-binary character and a gay person is actually being played by a gay person. And that is unfortunately radical and progressive when this is how it should have been. We still have white people playing Asian people in Hollywood today. And that offends me as, you know, an Asian person. That means that I can't be seen or represented authentically. So these are things that we need to be talking about early on because we want them to feel comfortable with who they are and how they want to identify. And all of these things, again, are get, just get amplified um, when we're putting media in front of them that is cornering them into certain places and saying that, well, this is what's going to sell because you look more like a girl than you do a boy. Or mm. even just saying that there is a difference with that when honestly, there's you know, so much fluidity um, in general. And there's a lot of biology that is more similar than they are different around male and female. Mm. How do you think that we can build a sustainable bridge between the porn industry and public health? Love that question. Thank you for asking it. First and foremost, by doing work to normalize sex, normalize sexuality. And I, that sounds so basic, but we're not even there yet to be able to see the connection between public health and pornography. So I want us just to like talk about it more. And it's podcasts like yours and education in schools around sexuality that is getting us closer to that point. Um, because I can do a talk in 45 minutes and draw the connection, but you know, not a lot of people can easily see that connection. People might say porn and health, but when we talk about public health, you know, it means we're talking about the population's well-being. What are the messages around race, around beauty standards, around safer sex methods, um, around consent that are informing the population about who they are as a human race? And that's, I think, the bridge. Um, but people don't even want to talk about sex, let alone pornography, without freaking out first. And that's why I don't think we're getting to that bridge being built anytime in in our lifetime, but I'm certainly still going to try to build that house. Do you think porn has a responsibility to educate kids if they're not receiving the education, like in your classes? I mean, I've had, I know that there's been some people who've suggested that before a porn scene, you do kind of like a, like a BTS interview. Kink does this because their scenes are pretty extreme. So before they have the performers talk about what they're going to do, what they're excited about, it's a, it's a real interview showing them as, as people about to perform for a fantasy. And then they interview them afterwards about their experience. How was it? You know, so the people see that it really is a very controlled environment because I think a lot of people think that, and of course it's different for every studio, but say the more ethical studios, you know, we always, the people I work for, we always have boundary checklists. We have ongoing conversations throughout the day about what the performers are okay and okay, okay with, not okay with. They're free to call cut at any time. We have nonverbal cues that we establish. Um, do you think that porn would be better off if they instilled these kinds of things before and after their scenes? Or do you think that this is something that's a responsibility of the parents and, and schools? I think it's the responsibility of anyone that works with young people. Um, and that does not necessarily mean pornography because it's not meant to work with young people. It's, you know, supposed mm -hmm. to be 18 and over. They have, you know, artistic liberties that they are entitled to, just like any other art form. 
unfortunately, because we are in a sexually repressed world, it by default is accessed by young people and it is being becoming education for young people. So I'm conflicted because I want to say, yes, porn, do this. But the onus isn't on an entire industry that is intended to be an entertainment industry to all of a sudden become an education one. I, mm -hmm. I want to put the onus on parents and educators to include this conversation, not just in homes and schools, but in all types of communities that um, are working with young people, because you can talk about these things in a way that doesn't have to be awkward and doesn't have to be personalized. But we're so scared of this concept of sexuality that no one's talking about it. So it makes sense why people want to put the blame on one particular industry and say, if they do their job better, everything will be better, which is not true because some others are, you know, learning about sex in other ways too. We can't put blame on porn. But we can, where there are, um, you know, avenues to, you know, put in a BTS, you know, a rating system, maybe, you know, um, uh, maybe higher restrictions on who's accessing what um, in terms of like the HR component so that what we are seeing is already something that's gone through a filtered process where we know that this is all ethically sourced and made, right? We're doing that with coffee. We're doing that with clothing. So why aren't we doing that to porn industry, the porn industry as well, so that we also know that the people behind this aren't working in sweatshops, right? And that they're getting a 401k and they're being paid at least minimum wage and they're getting tested, you know, whatever it might be. Like, those are the responsibilities to really take care of the people in the industry. And I feel like if we put in that effort and movements and make policies to do that, um, what our children will maybe accidentally be exposed to is likely to not be as harmful as it currently is because the mainstream porn exposure is higher than it should be. It shouldn't be that easy to access a rape role play between a black man called an ex-con and a woman being completely dominated and maybe not, you know, in a consensual way and also being called like the stepsister. Like I shouldn't be eight years old and be able to easily access that. And I can't, yeah. that's the problem. Yeah. yeah, that's so true. What specific, are there any like specific things that you would like to see happen to help alleviate this issue? Like either in schools or online? Um, obviously schools, schools aren't even, doing comprehensive sex ed, and that doesn't even right now include porn literacy. I am doing sex education in a way that is happening in very little you know, number of communities. Um, and it needs to start including it as like a mandatory part of sex ed. And the problem is oh, there's only like 22 states in the US anyway that require that sex ed be taught and 18 of them are required to be medically accurate. So think of the number of other states that aren't even getting this. And if they are, it's abstinence only and it's fear based and it's not medically accurate. So we're so far from even making porn lit a requirement. Um, but if you're asking, what would I like to see done? I'd like to see pornography literacy be embedded and integrated in school environments um, in middle school and high school. Um, I would like to see parents. Um, unlearning all of the things that they have, you know, been conditioned to believe around gender and sexuality and bodies um, and agency so that they can disrupt and be the generation of parents that creates and cultivates healthy, fully formed, fulfilled sexuality for their young people. And then those young people are getting sex ed so that they become, you know, parents or the older generation of leaders that are continuing that sex positivity in our world. But that's a huge cultural shift and that's a big ask. Yeah. What could a parent do who perhaps lives in one of those states that you mentioned that doesn't have um, sex education and definitely has no um, porn literacy options? Where, where could they go if they wanted to teach their children about this? Like, where would they start? They could start by buying Melissa Carnegie's book, Sex Positive Parenting. 
It's uh, something that they can just purchase, read it to themselves. It's a quick, easy read and extremely helpful. If they want to just access some things free online, they can go to amaze.org. If they have a pre-K kid to a third grader, there's excellent videos for both them and themselves to be able to talk about, you know, the basics of sexuality with their young person. If they're a parent of a middle schooler, amaze.org has excellent videos for that age group from understanding abortion to understanding, um, you know, the gender binary to understanding anxiety and depression and understanding the difference between teasing and harassment. And these are all free and so easy to just press play on and have a discussion with your tween or teen about. Um, if they are a parent of a high schooler, read Sexual Citizens by Jennifer Hirsch and Seamus Khan with your child if they are college prep, because um, it is talking about the climate of sexual assault on college campuses and how we are creating systems and environments that perpetuate sexual assaults and violence, and what we can do as um, a community and as a collective to actually dismantle those types of systems so that they are in service of colleges that are really for learning and not about experimenting with your toxic masculinity. So I think right. there's direct things that if you are in a state that isn't you know, supporting this type of stuff, you can get your own parent ed through those three simple ways, but um, it means, you know, taking that time and being willing to unlearn a lot of things that you thought were true and safe when in fact we have an entire Me Too movement to just, to you know, completely debunk that. Well, it sounds like it could be an educational experience for both the parent and the children. Totally. So kind of. And that's the best way to do it too. Yeah. 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 Justine, thank you so much. This has been such an informative conversation and um, I'm so glad that I had you on. Definitely gave me a lot to think about. You know, I mean, I was, I don't know how much you know about me, but I was raised by parents who worked in the adult industry. So I've been around porn my whole life, but um, I don't think my parents ever really gave me like the sex talk. I just kind of figured it out. There was no like sense of shame around it or anything, but I definitely um, would like to provide my daughter with a more complete, um, learning and understanding of, of sex and porn, especially since now the world is so different. You know, for me, when I was a kid, I used to, you know, steal magazines from my parents and, you know, I'd see like soft core porn and penthouse. I mean, you couldn't even show penetration in the magazines back then compared to like what kids can access online these days. I cannot imagine what it's like, um, as an adolescent or as a parent trying to navigate these new waters. It's just crazy. So thank you for all that information. So valuable. Yeah. Thank you for having me and trusting in me to contribute to your show that is doing the literal porn literacy for your listeners. <laughs> thank you. I I'm fortunate to have really incredible guests that, um, are able to teach my audience and myself something new every day. So it's, it's a wonderful gift to have. I'm very grateful. Um, can you tell everybody where they can find you online and possibly if they can contact you for more information? Yeah, you can contact me for more information through my website. It's justinefonte.com. Uh, and you can follow me on my social media, which is at I'm Justine AF. Fantastic. And you guys can follow me on Instagram and on Twitter at Holly Randall. Um, I'm back on TikTok, even though I swore off of it for a while. I'm actually putting clips of my podcast up there. So um, follow me on TikTok. It's at Holly Randall Unfiltered. And if you want to support the show, go to patreon.com slash Holly Randall Unfiltered. Thank you guys so much for joining us and I'll see you next week.